Welcome to Lecture 2 on Political Parties in Texas. We're going to talk today a little bit about party organization. It is easy to find articles where pundits opine about registered Republicans in Texas or registered Democrats in Texas, but there is no such thing as a registered Republican or a registered Democrat in this state because Texas does not have party registration. Voters may vote in either primary. Parties in Texas are organized at the precinct, county, and state levels. And they're organized specifically to conduct the party primary and have the convention. So the precinct is the most basic level of political organization at the local level. In each election precinct, a precinct chair is elected in the party primary. Now, the precinct chair is the local party official who heads the precinct convention and serves on the party's county executive committee. Also elected in the, in the primary is the county chair who heads the county executive committee, which is composed of the chair and the precinct chairs. The county executive committee is responsible for running a county's primary elections and for planning the county conventions. So at the state level, the state executive committee includes a state chair and a state vice chair. The state chair and vice chair are the top two state level leaders in the party and they're selected every two years at the state party conventions. The State Executive Committee is responsible for governing a party's activities throughout the state. They accept filings by candidates for statewide office, they help to raise funds for the party, and they help to establish party policy. Now, precinct conventions send delegates to the county convention and may submit resolutions for the party platform. The county conventions, or in urban areas, they call them district conventions, then turn around and elect delegates that go to the state convention. What do they do at the state convention? Well, they nominate, they officially nominate their candidates for the general election. They come up with the party platform and uh, then they vote on the rules that's going to govern the party for the next two years. Now, if you look in figure 4.1, it basically just gives you party organization in Texas. You see on the left side, the temporary organization, the precinct convention, the district convention, and the state convention. And the semi or the permanent organization, you have the chair, permanent chair, I'm sorry, the precinct chair, county chair, the executive committees, and so forth. Third parties, third parties in Texas. The two parties in power make it difficult for third parties to thrive, and third party candidates rarely win. Third parties and candidates, however, do emerge. There were the Grange and populist movements back in the early part of the century, the states' rights party, or the Dixiecrats, who were conservative Demo Democrats who abandoned the National Democratic Party in the 1948 presidential election, and then there was George Wallace's third party candidacy for president to defend segregation. Recently, we had Ross Perot, whose third party candidate candidacy basically ushered in two terms for President Clinton. And then we have La Raza Unida, which was formed a political party in Texas to, in order to bring attention to the concerns of Mexican Americans. Now, due to some nonpartisan elections, La Raza Unida Party has been able to gain control of some city councils, some school boards, and mayor's offices. And then, of course, there's the Libertarian and Independent Parties of Texas. Now, third parties can impact elections even if they don't win. The most significant recent threat of, to major party dominance in Texas came in 2006 in the election for governor. Rick Perry was seen as a vulnerable incumbent, especially during a year that was not particularly favorable for Republicans. 
Chris Bell, a former Houston member of Congress, won the Democratic nomination. But two major independent candidates also ran for governor, former Comptroller Carol Keaton Strayhorn and musician and humorist Kinky Friedman, whose slogan was, Why the Hell Not? When all the ballots were counted, Perry was re-elected, but only with 39% of the vote. It's hard to win a majority when there's so many different candidates in the race. Why do third parties almost never win? Well, the two parties, Republicans and Democrats, have made the rules on what it takes to get third party candidates on the ballot, and they've made ballot access exceedingly difficult. The two parties do not want independents running because it would then offer voters other choices. They're fine with competing against each other. They just don't want somebody else to come in. Now, Democrats may have trouble getting traction in Texas, but third parties with no or limited infrastructure or party organization are even more disadvantaged. Even when they get on the ballot, they rarely win. So why don't people vote for third parties? Well, Texas employs what's called the first past the post system which is an election rule that states the winner is the candidate who receives a plurality of the votes. In other words, you just have to win more than the other person. And Texas has what's known as single member districts, where there are only one representative for each district. Therefore, a vote for a third party candidate is seen as a wasted vote for somebody who has no chance to win. Now, for all the discussion about in the textbook about the division within the Republican Party, recent polling and recent research has called this into question. There was an article, uh, Tea Party, Conservatives by Another Name, Change and Continuity in the Texas Tea Party Identification by Jim Henson and Joshua Blank, both PhDs. Quote, it's clearly not evident in this initial research that Tea Party identifiers are significantly different demographically than Texas Republicans as a whole. Their results show that over the course of 24 surveys of registered voters in the state of Texas between February 2010 and October 2017, Tea Party identification averaged about 18%. Among Republicans, Tea Party identification averaged about 32%. Within, within the entire Texas electorate, 47% of Texas voters identified as Republicans. 86% of Tea Party identifiers also self-identify as conservative. This is hardly different from Republicans as a whole in Texas. And similar to Republican identification, ideology amongst Tea Partiers is not uniformly extreme. While clearly more conservative than the Texas electorate as a whole, Tea Party identifiers are not that much more conservative than the overall Republican electorate. Thinking about the Tea Party movement in the context of intra-party struggles over the agenda and identity of the Republican Party, the data suggests that Tea Party identification is not, or at least not only, a proxy for strong partisanship. The data are consistent with the understanding of Tea Party identifiers as intra-party assertions whose attitudes might be expected to leave them open to finding common cause with the GOP elites and in intra-party struggles in the name of conservative purity. In other words, there's not that much difference between a Tea Party member and a moderate Republican. After the Civil War, Texas entered into an era of one-party rule that lasted for well over a century. The only meaningful or competitive election was the Democratic primary. Republicans frequently did not run any candidate at all from any offices, and many counties had no Republican Party at all. However, by the mid-1940s, a split occurred between the liberal and conservative Democrats that developed in response to the New Deal and the civil rights policies of the day. We're going to end Lecture 2 there.